Hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. It's time to start the monthly garden tours again. I've been a little bit more kind of slow in terms of easing into this garden this year. Just a little bit more of a relaxed attitude. Got plenty going on at the other space. So let's treat this video a bit like this is the blank canvas. Here are some of the ideas. And so it's a nice comparison for when we do the July and August tours of when hopefully, if all goes well, this space feels like an absolute jungle of delicious food. In front of me here, a bunch of different onions, some multi-sown, some that have been grown from sets. These are the first crops that have actually been planted directly into the ground. I remember April last year, I think it was about 22 frosts, um, which is very cold. And this site is always a little bit behind a lot of other places. And so I always believe in the plants and that they'll be able to catch up, which is why now moving into mid-April is when I actually start to do a lot of the planting out. The next thing to do is gonna be the field beans and the broad beans, which is always one of my absolute favorites to put in. Now the first project of this year was creating this hotbed, which so far I'd say is 90% a success. The thing that I'm not happy with is I think the turnips have just grown too big and they've ever so slightly overcrowded the spring onions and the radish. But saying that, you know, I'm looking through and I've started harvesting radish here uh, from the hotbed. The carrot's looking good. This lettuce is fantastic and it kind of shows that I, I chose an upright lettuce in order to make sure that it wasn't going to encroach too much space on the crops either side. And so in the future, in terms of growing turnips, I either need to find a more upright growing turnip variety or give it wider space or because I'm not the biggest fan of turnips, I don't mind them, but maybe just grow something else instead. The really nice thing is that I've got pea shoots, which so good, so good to enjoy. The dill is coming through, started harvesting that. And also the coriander is looking really, really good. And if you're interested in the temperature, it's 32 degrees Celsius and it's around eight weeks old, six to seven weeks from the initial sowing. But yeah, eight weeks old, maintaining that heat using mainly ramiel chip wood and coffee grounds. I'm really happy. We're just on the tail end of two really stormy days. And so the kale has taken a little bit of a battering, but the kale is at my absolute favorite stage, which is one of my highlights of April is all of these flower shoots which are really coming out. These are absolutely delicious. The sweetness compared to the leaves is just much more enjoyable, I think, in terms of eating. And you've also got like a bit of a different crunch rather than leaf. You've got actually a little bit of structure, a bit like tender stem broccoli, but with kale. The main thing is just to keep on picking because if you stop picking, they're just gonna flower. So you just wanna keep on top of picking and I should be able to get harvest from these for at least another three to four weeks. And over here, there's also a, a red kale variety. So I can just add a little bit of uh, different color as well. So firstly, I wanna talk about this incredible red currant plant behind me that my dad has been fan training as a bit of a project of his for a few years. And I just wanted to draw attention to it because it's a single plant and it's spanning at least three meters long. Just to show you the potential of what can be done. And this is kind of north, northeast facing. Every year, a lot of red currants come from this. I've also been experimenting more with cover crops. So there's fetch in front of me here, um, which is looking nice and healthy, just kind of understanding the benefits, kind of gonna work out how to best get rid of it. That's one of the challenges with using cover crops in a domestic no-dig garden setup. And also in front of me, there's some interesting things happening. I've got this lupin, which is coming through into its third year. I got some foxglove, but there's also a little blackcurrant plant and a little cotoneaster, which have just popped up. And winter is a very nice rest time for us gardeners. And sometimes when you've been away for a few months and you get down low and you have a look, there's some really nice surprises. So that's a cotoneaster that I can pot up and maybe take over to Danaronen because that's come from the cotoneaster here, which has been a real iconic part of this garden. And also a little blackcurrant, which any blackcurrant seedling I'd 
I think deserves a new home. Here's another thing that I've just noticed. It's a, it's a gooseberry, and I don't know if it's one or two plants. Seems like two individual plants, potentially from a cutting, but it looks more like maybe an actual gooseberry has dropped here. And it's created these two beautiful little plants. So I'm gonna just temporarily pot them up and I'm gonna give them a nice new home. There's something so nice about especially perennial fruits. When you get free plants, the potential just is lovely. I thought I'd show you or introduce you to my least favorite bed in the garden. And this actually is kind of gonna be the last full growing season here in this garden. And so I've set myself a challenge where me and this bed get along and I can finish the season where I both feel like we've, uh, we've suddenly rejoined a bit of a connection. I think mainly it's down to soil and with compaction, especially from rainfall, there's this big debate that I'm going through with regards to broad forking some of my raised beds just to add a bit of aeration. It's something that I'm gonna explore in more detail in an upcoming video, but I just wanna make sure that this bed, I, uh, I give it some love and attention because sometimes the furthest parts of the garden are the parts that you don't see as often. And so it might literally be a case where I just grow a load of potatoes in here. And if I get a decent crop, I'm happy. And the nice thing about potatoes, they don't need much care and attention but you can get a really nice harvest from it. Quite an exciting part of the garden here at the start because it is a propagation space. I've got broad beans and field beans ready to go out. There's garlic, which is growing well. Two different varieties at two different stages. There's been a lot of garlic from that quite small, compact space. Perpetual spinach coming through. I'll probably let that flower. It doesn't look amazing, the flowers, but the actual structure of it being about this tall it looks really nice and it might fill in a little, little bit of a, a boring corner of the garden. And then obviously the seedling shelves, which are starting to fill up. And again, with the slight difference of having two locations, I'll, I'll be bringing a lot of the spare seedlings over to here to grow on because this is always about two or three weeks behind in terms of growing season. And the other thing that I'm always excited about is this grapevine, which has now been trained all the way up this way, across, and down the other side of the solar tunnel. And so I cannot wait for summer to see the whole grapevine in leaf with loads and loads of delicious grapes. I've also just put in some more seedlings here. I've got some onions that I'm gonna treat more for spring onions, a bit of beetroot and some radish here in a cold frame. This is a cold frame that I designed, available from hughesgarden.com. And so once those start to develop, I'm then going to plant up this section of the bed and move the cold frame down just so I can give those plants a nice head start. And the spring cabbage is finally picking up again. And so I can go in and start harvesting the bigger of the leaves, which I can chop up and use and start eating. I'm not gonna keep this here for too long because I've got a bit of a plan actually it's, it's kind of based on permaculture. You've got to look at where do you most often find yourself walking in the garden? What are like the key travel lines or lines of travel? And for me, it's from the gate past here in front of this cold frame and into the solar tunnel. And so along this line, I'm going to plant the things which I need to harvest the most often. Usually that's going to be things like salads, which will be in that top corner where it's a bit more shady, but also things uh, like herbs as well, and some of my favorite vegetables like peas. And so those are gonna be prioritized where I don't have to venture too far off the path. And then everything else will be planted basically in proximity to priority of what I like eating the most. Um, also based on how much sun they need and also how much maintenance they need, just so this garden can be as easy as possible to look after. I've got a good story here and a bad story. And so we'll start off with the bad story. This is the only surviving purple sprouting broccoli out of a group of around seven. And they just got absolutely annihilated with the freezing cold weather. And so to have one, it's a little bit like it's teasing me. It's like, you could have had a lot more. <laughs> so that's the bad story. The good story is this, which is 
caraway, a beautiful herb that I really, I, I don't know how it's happening, but I planted it one year and then it just keeps coming back every single year and it's self-seeding everywhere. I've got more growing through here. I've got loads of these pots of potted up caraway seedlings. I'm incredibly amazed how hardy it is as a crop, but also uh, how tasty and also how potent the, the green seeds are. And so I really wanna just share this out because I just planted a packet thinking, oh no, caraway, it feels like, oh, there's no chance it'll grow well, but it grows amazingly well in this climate. So at least that's something to feel nice about and uh, that needs to stop teasing me. I really like this top part of the garden. It feels a little bit more enclosed, especially as I start to add more vertical structures around the place. This is more of a herb flower area. We've got another border on the other side. And I, I, every year I always kind of have this um, slight worry that the asparagus is just gonna give up the ghost. But I'm so grateful because Sam quite rightly pointed out that there's signs of life with the asparagus yet again. And so now this is year four, this should be when we start enjoying a lot of asparagus and also a lot of strawberries. I've gone through, replaced a lot of the older plants, replaced with uh, a lot of the strawberry runners last year. I'm really looking forward to that coming into life. Welcome to the polycrub, where it's already a little bit too hot for me. <laughs> Not for this chard, this Incredibly, this Swiss chard is entering its third year, which I didn't think was possible, but just kept on top of taking off all the flower shoots. And it's huge. It's, uh, it's not a particular, it's just normal bright lights, but it is absolutely huge. This whole polycrub, in a sense, has now been prepped ready for the new growing season. So we've done a lot of chop and drop of everything that was growing here over winter. Just the main thing now is to make sure that I keep the beds watered. We've got some self-sown carrots in the top corner, uh, which are looking quite nice and healthy. And also taking inspiration from the solar tunnel, there is a grapevine planted here, which is beginning to spread down. And so again, imagine in three or four years, this whole side of the polycrub hopefully will be covered with a beautiful grapevine. And so my approach to undercover growing around this time of year is yes, I could squeeze in a lot of crops if I wanted, but because this is so well insulated, I reckon I'll be putting my first tomatoes in here in about two or three weeks time. And so I'm gonna just prioritize effectively those really high value crops rather than trying to fit in more salads because there's only so much salad that I want to eat after all. I cannot wait to take you on the journey of how this garden is going to completely transform over the next few months and so stay tuned to see how this is going to look in another four to five weeks and if you're curious I got a playlist here which is all of the garden tours from last year so you can start to kind of get a little bit of a feel of how if you're new to this channel, how I approach growing food.